Hi, I'm Rosie Acosta. I'm a meditation teacher, speaker, and author of You Are Radically Loved, a healing journey to self-love. Look, I grew up in East Los Angeles during the 92 LA riots, and it set me on a troubled path. I didn't grow up with mentors in my life, so I turned to reading as many books as I possibly could to learn about the purpose of life. In my journey, I found that having these conversations gave me life, and I decided I wanted to create a place where I could share these conversations with my community. So come have a sit with me as we learn about, well, everything. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Radically Loved Podcast. Today, I'm joined by a very special guest. He's an award-winning New York Times bestselling author, Stephen Kotler. We're talking about his latest book, NAR Country, where he invites us inside his laboratory for an experiment in high stakes dream chasing. It's a personal journey into the practical side of the still somewhat uncharted realm of peak performance aging. This book is part adventure, party living experiment, and part late in life peak performance primer. All I know is that what he achieves in this book is incredibly innovative and it actually made me excited about aging. I'm so excited to share this conversation with you. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. But before the episode begins, I just wanted to fill you in that I am currently hosting Radio Headspace, and co-hosting Dear Headspace. I've also created some really great content for the Headspace app. So download it, check it out. Let me know your thoughts. Here is my conversation with Stephen Collar. Well, well, well. I think this is the third or fourth time you've been on the show. (laughs) Is it? I think so. Yeah. So thank you so much for being here as usual. Well, I take a Thank second. you for so much for having me back as usual. I have so many questions. I've got a whole list and I'm going to actually try and stick to it because I want to make sure that you answer all of my inquiries. Um, right before we came on, I was telling you how I have reading the book just made me realize how in fear I have been in the last six years, I would say since starting since 2017, when I stopped skateboarding and I'm saying skateboard, like I would get on it, not thinking about falling, not thinking about injury, not thinking about anything just like, Oh yeah, fun. Let's go to Venice or let's go to watch the, the skaters at the skate park and, you know, bring, bring the boards or, you know, bring the bike or bring the roller skates, like just go have fun and not think about it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you have those falls as you age that create that, (laughs) that trigger or that internal trauma where you start to think as you get older, oh, it's going to take longer for me to heal. Oh, wait, I have to do this thing. I have to travel here. I have to speak at this thing, or this is going to, if I get injured, then I can't do X, Y, Z, which then creates that framework of living this life on the pre-fabricated ski paths of life, right? I mean, as I was reading it, I just kept feeling this sense of what you say, if you don't use it, you lose it. And It was so obviously it's very metaphorical right from the gate when I started reading from the preface of punk rock to the intro to, you know, going into your entries. Uh, What I really loved the most about this book was I think out of all the books I've read, aside from the novels, right, like this was very much a practical application experience of, oh, this is how peak performance works. Like this is how it works, not just, oh, this is how it benefits you. These, This is all the science behind it. This is why it's going to benefit you. It's like, no, this is, this is how it happens in your life. So I'm going to stop talking. Obviously I'm excited. So <laughs> just, 
kind of looked away. There's like 11 questions in there, baby. So I, what, what, do you have one, do you have a singular question, Rosie? Okay, do I have a singular you question? A I guess. comment about all that. Okay, <laughs> I guess because I feel like I'm a Stephen Kotler expert. I'm going to just dub myself that okay. um, because I can refer to a lot of your work. So I guess let's just begin with what prompted this specific book for you. The core of our country, it's peak performance aging. And there's a couple of different focuses. Uh, the background, right? The, the thing you need to know, and you just mentioned it, we have a traditional theory of aging. And most people have bought in, if not entirely, to at least parts of it. It's what I like to call the long, slow route theory. It is the idea that all of our physical skills, all of our mental skills decline over time. There's nothing we can do to stop the slide. And that's just not true. We thought it was really true. If you used to, the, the idea really dates back to Freud and from Freud in 1907, when he makes the comment that sort of creates that idea to roughly the mid 1990s, all we did is figure out why that was true. Right. It started to crack apart in the mid to late 1990s and has now completely splintered. Most people don't know the news story. The news story is everything we used to think that falls off a cliff over time. And all those skills do decline over time. That is true. It's just that we now know they're user to lose it skills. And if you never stop using them, you get to hang on to them and even advance them for far later in life than anybody thought possible is the first part. The second thing you talked about is this sort of mindset of old. And the mindset of old, there's a bunch of biological reasons why it sh shows up. You listed one of the big ones, which is what uh, in, science, in science language we talk about is allostatic load, which is trauma over time, right? Yeah. It's the impact of trauma on your psychology and your physiology over time. And um, th that definitely makes us more risk averse over time and, and things along those lines. We're all, we can talk about the millions of reasons you want to fight back against that, but the place you got to start is with mindset because what you're really talking about is this mindset of old and what we now have learned and this is this is one of the most well documented facts in aging is the impact on mindset on aging and a positive mindset towards aging which is i am thrilled with what's possible in the second half of my life and i think my best days are ahead of me end result is an extra seven and a half years of health and longevity it's huge. Like it's more important than losing weight if you're obese. It's as important as maybe quitting smoking. Like it's it's huge. Um, most of us, this mindset of old for a bunch of different biological reasons that sort of made sense at the time, but don't make sense over time. It can show up as early as 30. I like to say that peak performance aging starts young. And this is one of the main reasons because this mindset is so crippling. And it really leads us away from these kind of activities like snowboarding, like skateboarding. And it's not that you are right. The older body takes longer to heal than the younger body. That's true. What's also true is our healing technologies um, are getting really, really good, especially for the kinds of things that get damaged, you know, playing these kinds of games. So one, our healing technologies are getting really, really good. That's not an argument I'm making in the book, but it is like it's real, it's just, you know, that's where the technology has progressed to this point. Um, so it's a lesser concern. But the other side of it is for a million different reasons, as you pointed out, like you actually, you need to keep pushing and challenging yourself um, over time um, in order to get toward peak performance aging. And you asked a question. So where did all this come from? Now I've let that's the background. Background. Sorry. So I'll, no, I, don't I apologize. It's great. Just um, go. This is everybody's so happy because I'll just there's jump a bunch right. of in the re, in the literature on peak performance aging, which I've spent 20 years studying in facets. But one thing to know is that flow science runs straight through this literature. And the reason is she sent me high, the godfather of flow psychology had argued that flow itself is one of the major engines of adult development. It's how we grow up. On the other side of a flow state, we've gained skills. We're more adaptive, we're more complex, and flow expands empathy and wisdom. So like it makes us into an adult. He argued that it may be the main engine of adult development. I, I think it's one of them. It's a big one though. So this field, this has been my field for a long time. Um, anyways, my point is that in around I guess it was 2019. There were a bunch of new ideas 
in flow science, in peak performance aging, in body cognition, a bunch of other whiz bang fields that I, that I was looking at. I was like, in the lab, if these things are right, older adults should be able to onboard incredibly difficult, challenging physical skills like never before. Like there's a bunch of things that say all this is possible. Nobody really tested it in any radical way. And I said, well, if this stuff is true for a bunch of personal reasons, for a bunch of other reasons, we could talk about all the reasons why. But I basically said, if these things are true, I should be able to learn how to park ski in my 50s. And I, I ran the experiment. I didn't think I was going to be successful. I really didn't. Um, and it just it worked incredibly well for me. It, then it worked incredibly well for other people. Then we realized, like, and then so many other people in experiments that we realized this was a thing. Like, we had uncovered a bunch of really interesting secrets about peak performance aging um, that had allowed that allow older adults to progress in seemingly impossible activities and things along those lines. And uh, that was sort of where where it started. But it really just started with the. I had a conversation with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the last conversation we had before he died, where he basically sort of told me as one flow junkie to another, he was like, listen, man, as you get older, have many entrances in the flow. Don't just have one or two, have a backup plan, right? Like, cause aging can take away some of your ability to have a backup plan. Otherwise you're, cause he was literally, he was in his eighties and I, he was a mountaineer, he was a rock climber. I called him and I wanted to ask, talk about the impact of, those sports on his, on his career and on flow. And he, in the middle of the conversation, he's just like, Steven, you got to be careful. And I was like, well, what do you mean, Mike? And he's like, you get to my age, you do something your whole life for flow, like rock climbing or mountaineering, you get to my age and you can barely get out of bed. You need a backup plan. You've got to be careful. And I was like, oh shit. Okay. He's right. I need a backup plan. We can talk about why I thought park skiing might be a good backup plan because it sounds crazy, but that was where all of it started. He said something to me that sort of took 20 years of research and crystallized and I went, oh shit, I got to do this and I got to do this now. And uh, I just, you know, designed this crazy experiment and it worked, you know, it worked so well that I ended up writing a book about it. And the final thing you said that, that's worth talking about, I think, is and I'm so glad you saw this. It really makes me really happy that, that it's visible. It's really nobody's ever been able to write sort of a book about applied peak performance or applied peak performance aging, not because we haven't known the science. It's because it it's complicated writing to make it not boring, right? There's yeah. like, I did it in the guise of an adventure story in you know very unusual circumstances like and it's an enormous writing challenge like it's really the most complex like you'll never tell it's a fun book to read you laugh a lot i think and it's super informative but like it's one of the more complicated books i've ever had to write because to pull that off is really challenging but what i want the reason i worked so hard on it to do that is it gave gives readers i think what you exactly got which is what's been lacking in the literature is what does this shit look like on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Right? It's the thing at the Flow Research Collective is the hardest thing to explain to our clients in talking to coaches, peak performance, everybody. Like the thing that they, you know, is the hardest is what does it look like? You can say things like peak performance is a checklist, but until you see somebody applying that checklist day after day after day for three months, which is so actually it's for a year and a half, it's the actual span of the book. It's really hard to understand what the hell anybody's talking about. But what you read in the book, you're like, oh. I know what to do. Yeah. Shit, it's right there. Yeah. And it makes so much sense. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the, the, yeah, the research, the application makes so much more sense to me. I mean, it made sense back when I did flow for writers, when you were like, you have to write every day or you're not a writer, <laughs> like you have to do it. And it wasn't, I mean, it was something so simple to me like that to say, oh, right. How am I going to get better at something if I'm not doing it every day? If I'm not allowing myself the experience of challenging myself, especially when I feel like a, a cursor is just like aggressively blinking at me and I have nothing to write or nothing to say. And then with regard to peak performance and with regard to this book, just what I was gathering, you know, this whole idea that we 
have these desire, we still have the the desire is still there even as we age, if if it not, it becomes larger. And we have these mental limitations, which I never even considered, right? I just think, no, like our body ages, it's part of, and we're, it's so accepted in our culture, right? Like, oh, that's fine, you know? It's the most widely held and culturally acceptable stereotype in the world is ageism. And what's crazy about it is, this is, this is a woman named Becca Levy. She's at Yale. This is her entire field. She's written books about it. The impact of a negative stereotype on aging, like on our, we are literally killing our elderly with these stereotypes. It's astounding. And it's socially acceptable globally, um, which is wild. And then if you look at the most success, like the most successful uh, age-friendly societies on earth, they all at their backbone have cross general generational friendships and they don't have negative stereotypes towards aging. So they have really positive stereotypes towards aging and um, a lot of cross generational standpoints and the places where people age really poorly don't have either of those things. Um, so there's a real, it's odd, like there's a real penalty and like we're hurting other people. It's not just ourselves. If we're just hurting ourselves. We want that. We're literally hurting other people with these attitudes. If we've had the science to prove, the research to prove that that's not the case, why then are we not more focused on it? One is it's super balkanized, um, meaning there are, even on the physical side, like people don't realize this, but like, for example, um, VO2 max is one of these user to lose it skills. And, and this was this is my favorite of, of all the data. This is one of my favorites because for years, if you talk to people on the physiology side about aging, they they, they beat you with VO2 max because it starts to decline at about 25. VO2 max is the upper edge of your respiratory right abilities. And it starts to decline at 25. And by 50, it, it starts to really, it, the decline accelerates. And they didn't think there was anything you could do at all, period. And what they're now finding, they're now, they started testing octogenarian triathletes just to see if this is actually true and it turns out successful octogenarian triathletes have the vo2 max of like 35 year olds and the world record is actually like a 25 year old i think the dude's 88 and um this is a new discovery right but even if you if you go one so that's stamina if you go one category over into strength and start talking to strength coaches they still believe the VO2 max thing is true, even though in strength, we figure strength is another thing, falls off a cliff. But properly trained, you can sort of halt the slide at like a loss of about 70%, 30% of your muscle fibers are probably going to go away. But the remaining 70% can more than compensate for what lost, lost. And some of the stuff is weirdly, so here's a weird one. In, in our country, I suggest, I, I train with a weight vest. One of the reasons is bone density. Bone density weight vests are, are known to improve bone density. So we know muscle fibers fall off a cliff, but the problem is actually bone density declines over time and your bones limit the amount of strength you can add to your muscles. And if you fix bone density, then you can add more muscle fibers. And we have lots of different ways. Like if you don't want to hike with a weight vest, there's a company called OsteoStrong that like in a 15 minute session with them. They load the bones in a very specific way using four different machines and exercises that you do. And they get huge increases in bone density in at any age. Um, and you start adding muscle mass on top of it immediately. So like everything we used to think wasn't possible, we now know it, it's really possible. And there's an entrance point for everyone. Like you can be 85 years old, go to an Austria strong, have like three or four sessions with them, go into the gym and, and add, you know, 120% strength in eight weeks. And we've got like data showing this is possible again and again and again. Um, it's remarkably cool. Um, I don't know where we started with that, but I'm I mean, no, 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 because I, I because, no, 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 because I, you, the whole, basis of this is that you can teach an old dog new, new tricks that is that well, the, is the yeah, whole... let, let, yeah let me let me hit the one other thing that i want to say on that because where this comes from is the coolest thing it's gene cone's research which you're familiar with from the book gene cone so peak performance aging has a godmother it's ellen langer at harvard it's got a godfather it's gene cone 
at the National Institute of Aging. But um, Gene discovered, well, he didn't do the, he didn't do the, he figured out what it produces. So we now know, thanks to three different things, the brain changes over time in remarkably positive ways. So there are genetic, there are genes that only turn on with experience. There are parts of the two hemispheres of the brain essentially function in opposition to one another until you get to about 50. And then they start to work together and increases this cooperation between hemispheres until your 80s. Um, finally, in your 50s, your brain starts to recruit underutilized regions and, and use them for things you need. The result is that in our 50s, if we get stuff right, and talk about what that means in a minute, you gain access to whole new levels of intelligence and really complicated levels of intelligence, analogical thinking and uh, critical thinking, problem solving, like really hard stuff really starts to come online, multi-perspectival thinking. We get access to whole new levels of creativity and divergent thinking, which is the hardest aspect to train. Um, huge new levels of empathy open up, which is phenomenal, um, and wisdom. And wisdom is a clearly definable neurobiological trait, and it protects against cognitive decline because it's a very diffuse network in the brain. So the wiser we get, the more sort of brain regions we're utilizing, the more we can stave off cognitive decline, um, another use it or lose it thing. So all of this stuff has, starts happening in our 50s. And as Gene Cohn pointed out, in all in these a number of really huge studies that he ran pointed out old dogs, it's not only that they can learn new tricks, it's that they're better at learning certain tricks than younger dogs for a lot of different reasons. So like you get legitimate cognitive superpowers. And as you mentioned, I think our desires, like the, the urge to figure out, like to go on these NAR style quests to like finish, finish, unsolved, finish unfinished business, all that stuff um, really like, we really start to figure out exactly who we are and sort of like what we want to do in this world. Right at the same time, we start to believe that our skills are eroding. We can no longer do it. And it's just the skill erosion part. All that stuff is just not true. The only thing that is true is allosteric load is really increased and you're a fuck of a lot more scared. And, <laughs> and, and that I want to changes definitely how you, that, well, that changes how you approach the activity. It doesn't change the activity. But it changes how. You, well, that's what we did, right? In our yeah. studies, it changed the approach to park skiing, which is a very dangerous, tricky, complicated sport. We changed the way I learned it, the way I t we, uh, people learned it, um, to deal with allosteric load and some of these other issues. Um, but absolutely mandatory to, to like go in those directions over time. I mean, I think the fear component was was so compelling to me because I could relate to it so much and not even thinking about it in that way. To me, it just has been uh, something that's happened over time. My decisions to not do that extra ski run or uh, no, I don't think I want to go yeah, and do so, the double diamonds today. I don't think I want to do, you know, oh yeah, I don't want to go do a half pipe because. You so know, let me, let me, tell you, my let, me let, let me talk to you about why that happens. Cause it's not in the book. Um, it is in the huge training we built out in the book, but it's fascinating. You're going to totally get it in a second. You're going to start laughing. So from basically birth to like, mid twenties, we are driven as people by our seeking system and our play system. We get some social stuff coming in in our teenage years, but it's about early, our early life is about seeking more than like, who are we in the world? How do we want to live? I want the right partner. I want the right job. Like we're seeking. That's a dopamine and norepinephrine underpin system. So those are the drugs don't mean these are very potent feel good neurochemicals that's what we're addicted to as soon as we get stuff we like i've got the right partner i've got the right apartment i've got the right job we trade the neurochemicals and we want pro-social uh safety and security chemicals serotonin endorphins oxytocin right and we become addicted to those chemicals which are we want them they're the ones that say hey this is good stuff protect it conserve it you've got it but we're literally old. Where does this mindset of old come from? We're addicted to the wrong chemicals. Old people are addicted to the wrong drugs. Peak performance aging demands the seeking system and the play system alongside these other systems. You have to ignite all of them. Otherwise, you get this mindset of old and fear is going to win. 
Yeah. Oh, well, I'd love that you talk about that too. Well, you don't talk. I mean, I wish that you would, would have put that in there. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I, I tried to keep the neuroscience after <laughs> Arden Impossible. Like I heard for years, dude, you wrote a neuroscience tech book. And I'm like, no, no, I really didn't. Have you ever read a neuroscience tech book? And that's what I've read them. I didn't yeah. write one. Trust me. Yeah. That said, I wanted less science, more applied and we booted, we took basically like the science is all in the footnotes, some in the appendix. Yeah. And then we, we have a class like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and for people, the art of impossible is a great place to start. I mean, you talk about that, you know? So if, if people, if, if you're watching this, listening to this and you, you want to learn more about it, that is the best place for you to start. Um, Okay, I have I want to say just my general feel of reading the book because I felt like there was so much wisdom, you know, I'm going to take it into my space where I understand the world. I really really loved the the metaphors and this the inquiries of the self of quieting the ego, widening your perspective, all the obstacles that we have to overcome in order for us to get into the mental space of taking these huge risks. Uh, I love that you essentially are talking about park skiing as something that happens above the surface of the earth, which just literally blew my mind just within itself, because I'm like, oh, there's so much possibility here. Like there, there is something so exciting about learning that we get better as we age, that we can achieve something that we might think in our minds, we can't achieve learning a new skill, you know, achieving a, a peak performance level with our physical body as we age, because we think, oh, no, I'm getting a little, it takes a little longer. Or I woke up, my low back is inflamed. And I feel like if I get on that slope today, it's not going to feel as good or whatever, you know, but so for me, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, how you, you applied this experience and really, uh, uh, pose these, these ideas as a way for us to, um, yeah, like learn that we can do things that we think we might not be able to do. Here's the thing that I think is cool about like all of that. So we started this conversation and I said, you got to change your mindset around aging. Right. But I will personally like it would like even me. Right. And I've been working in this field for a very long time. I like you don't have to convince me of the lifestyle. I run a hospice care sanctuary. Like we've I've seen peak performance aging in dogs and humans yeah. and myself, like, all of it. Uh, but still, there's remnants of that mindset. But when you take on a, a, a difficult challenge in your 40s or your 50s and suddenly you see that like uh, what what happened to me is like, when I set out to learn to park ski, I said, if it takes five years, that's fine, whatever. I wanna learn this, I don't care how long it takes. The methodology we devised worked so well that I did it in a season, right? And it was shocking. Um, but what the coolest part about that was, it didn't matter what my mindset was on the front end of that because that was so wild that whatever I thought was possible, it's gone. Like it's just, everything's gone. Everything I thought was going to be the second half of my life. And I thought I had pretty good ideas about what was, you know what I mean? Like it's just, it's gone because every time I go to the ski mountain and I'm 55 years old, I'm doing things that I couldn't do at 54 or 53 or 50, like it's still right. And that's amazing. That's amazing. And, um, and you know, even the physical stuff that's gone wrong along the way, I've come back from a ton of shit along the way already in, you know, three years of playing these games. And so that's the other thing. People are worried. I, you know, one of the bad, good things that you learn after breaking 87 bones along the way is not that big of a deal. I mean, it hurts and it's unpleasant and there's a long recovery period, but you learn a ton about yourself along the way. One, you really do. And I'm not saying I wish it upon anybody, but it's nowhere near as horrible as anybody thinks. And um, you can come back from far more, you know what I mean? Like far more, far longer. And you're not as fragile as you think you are. Is that the other that was actually one of my next questions is, 
You know, I, I love watching pro athletes. I love that you, during the pandemic, you were addicted to watch, watching the slush videos. <laughs> like, oh my God, that's so awesome and hilarious and, and obviously a great catalyst to now creating this book. I mean, that's sort of like, it really, slush videos are these park skiing videos. And that's sort of where everything came from because I was watching them do park tricks. And I realized that like, even though I couldn't do anything in a terrain park and I had never seen park skiing before. I'd never even watched it. Like I watch ski videos all the time, but I never even, I was not a park skier. I didn't care. I didn't speak the language. I didn't know what the tricks were called. I didn't know what half the features were called. I didn't know what you did with any of them. Like forget about it. Um, but I got addicted to watching these videos and it, that was the first realization. I was like, Holy shit, they're doing this thing. If I can, I already can do like a third of it. Could I just build on that one inch at a time in a way that like slowed down my process, but was safe. That was the first realization was I was looking at it. I was like, I can't do that, but I can actually do like one tenth of that already. And can you build on that safely? That was the first question. It came from like watching these videos, trying to like deal with COVID like everybody else. Yeah. Well, and I think that the biggest thing too, as I, I was reading it, putting myself in the time and place where, as you were writing this, as you were keeping these entries in 2020, the news and everything that we were were being fed was just how fragile we were as people, as, you know, a a sick society, you know, with a lot of people, you know, it it was like our health was being put right at the forefront. Well, you also have to remember, by the way, I had COVID before I had COVID, right? So like I was, I was already, but when I started this experiment, (laughs) I was already recovering from COVID. I was like, okay, what else do you got? (laughs) Like I did that next. I like how you put that right at the beginning. Like, and then I wasn't feeling too well. Yeah. That (laughs) have, did you have it again after that? I just had it again. And it was the exact same illness. I was like, oh, I've been here before, which was great because the like the three nights when I was having trouble breathing, the first time I thought I was going to die. The second time I knew that like, this is how you fit, how you do this. Like, yeah. it was terrifying, but I like, there was a part of me that I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this again. Okay. So but, explain okay. that the familiarity, right? We have the experience. How can we then apply that as we age to continuing to do something and improve on a peak yeah, performance the level. Other thing you have to just think about, I say this in the book, but playing through plant pain, it be, learning to be uncomfortable, to be uncomfortable is foundational to be performance, but playing through pain, playing through injury, like you're gonna like, that's old age, all of us, that's coming for all of us. At all, and like it's just like that is what is going to come for all of us. We are going to be playing through pain. We are playing through injury. We are going to be dealing with limited capabilities, right? That's that's going to happen no matter what. Like sooner or later, right? We're uh, so you have to like. I'm just saying you, you can either run away from it, be scared of it, and be terrified. Oh my God, this is coming for me. Or figure out you a lot tougher than you think. You're a lot less fragile. That now I want to say something. Cause we're not, we haven't talked about it. I trained for almost a year before I, I did this. And one thing for sure is unless you are limited in financial resources, but even then you should figure this particular one out. You want to start any of the, any phys- hard physical activities. If you've been injured over time, you need somebody to assess your body because like if you injured your ankle at 18, you could have started to injure other parts of your body and, and a movement professional can watch you walk, can watch you move. And you want to fix that in before you start training. Otherwise, you're just asking for trouble. So it, like you have to be you can't be like 18. You can't be 18 about it anymore. Right. You really like you have to be really smart about it. And the places I screwed up. Like the places I ended up getting injured, it was because I didn't, I was impatient at the front end of my training and didn't do the handful of things that would have sought. Like if I would have done five things and taken like an extra month at the front end of my training to do some, I would have had almost zero problems along the way. 
Um, so y- yes, but you gotta, you gotta, one, you're going to have to learn how to play through pain sooner or later. And two, you want to be smart about it. But um, if you are those things, it's remarkable, just remarkable what you can accomplish. Yeah. I mean, you talk about having those mental skills to navigate the terror that comes with navigating the terrain. And I feel like that, again, you give such great application, experiential, uh, you know, demonstrations for people to be able to see that. I still think of it as yeah, you, that's still the cliff. You still have to jump off the cliff. You know, you can do all the work to get yourself right up to that edge, but you still have to be willing to go into that unknown, you know, and and through that, uh, what do you call it? When you're going fast geometry, right? When you're in that fast geometry and, and there's no time for the internal debate, like that really stayed with me. I'm like, oh shit, like that is so, that is so huge. It's so important to be able to put yourself in that. I mean, you're not growing if you're not putting yourself in that position. And I can see how as we age, it we're less inclined to put ourselves in a position where we're taking chances. Right. And the, the I mean, it's so if you were to summarize peak performance aging in a sentence, right? The whole book into one sentence. If you want to rock to you drop. What you need to do is engage in challenging, creative, and social activities that demand dynamic, deliberate play. We talk about what all these words mean and take place in novel outdoor environments. So challenging social and creative activities. There's a bunch of peak performance stuff tied into that. Dynamic, deliberate play is where I want to focus our attention for a second. Dynamic is just a fancy way of saying it hits all five categories of functional fitness, strength, stamina, balance, flexibility, and agility, which are the five core categories you have to train over time. And we, when I say those are the five, this is not just me. This is the World Health Organization. If you want peak performance aging, 150 to 300 minutes of stamina training a week, two strength training days a week, three balance flexibility. And I mean, like we have an exact, we know exactly what you need. All I'm saying is pick a dynamic activity and you hit all five at once and you don't have to do two hours of training a day in the gym. You can go skiing or play tennis or bet. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of options. Um, their deliberate play is the opposite. Deliberate practice is repetition and incremental advancement. It just turns out for learning for it. Play is rep- deliberate play is repetition without repetition. It's repetition with improvisation. You do the same thing, but you had a little funky flourish because it's more fun and it's, Less shame, less environment, better learning. You just go farther, faster, right? Um, and you get better neurochemicals from play than from deliberate practice. You just, so you learn faster. And novel outdoor environments are about using the brain. If you want to stave off cognitive decline, you need new neurons and new neural networks. That takes place in the hippocampus. It's the map making machinery in the brain. It, it, it does long term memory, it does place. And it's designed from evolutionary perspectives to remember when we have emotionally charged experiences in novel outdoor environments, that's what it was as hunter gatherers. Where were you when you got attacked by the tiger? Where were you when you found the ripe fruit on the tree? Like that's what the brain is designed to do. That's survival. So we will birth new neurons up into the day we die, 700 a day in the hippocampus. If you want to hang on to those neurons and actually turn them into neural networks and use them to stave off cognitive decline, you need novel experiences in outdoor environments. So like all the things we're talking about sounds like risk taking, sounds like a bunch of stuff. It's actually the easiest way to tackle peak performance aging, the least amount of time, the most fun the best results because you're just getting your biology to work for you rather than against you. That's the whole, that's sort of the whole point. And you could, there's the other thing is, now this is the thing that you do have to jump off the cliff, but you want to go one inch at a time, right? So like the cliff is about an inch today, tomorrow it's two inches, the day after it's three, right? At the start of the book, I jumped off a two and a half foot stump. By the end of the book, 
I was jumping off 20 foot things, right? But like it started literally third day of the ski season with a two and a half foot stump and over the next what up, right? And the point wasn't jumping off cliffs, that, but like that, I mean, even in my progression, I started really cautiously. Like I've been skiing for 40 years. I've jumped off two and a half foot things all the time, but that's sort of where I started at the front end. And I went inch by inch. Laird Hamilton always used to say this. He's like, you know, people see me 50, surfing a 50 foot wave on a, on a screen and think, oh my God, that's amazing. There's no way I could ever do that. He's like, maybe, but what they didn't see is like last week, I surfed a 49 and a half, and a half foot wave. And the week before that it was 49 feet and it was 48 and a half foot and then 48. You know what I mean? And I've been doing yeah. this since I was three years old. So like you look and you see, oh my God, that looks like a giant cliff. And I'm like, no, no, this was literally just an inch more from what I did the day before. Wow. I mean, that is uh, like the most, <laughs> it's like the biggest lesson of 2023, if not a lifetime. I mean, that metaphor is, uh, you know, words to live by, I think. Um, yeah. If people don't get to see the behind the scenes of what it takes to get to that level. And I think that a lot of the times we might get discouraged because we think, oh, how do I go from two, a two foot stump to a 30 foot, you know, cliff, cliff jump, you know, and we think that we need to get from point A to point B in one false swoop. And, and that's just not, that's not the case, but it's not what we see, you know, it's not what has been shown to us. You know, it's not, we're not seeing Laird's practice runs. We're not seeing him surf those no, smaller it, waves. That's not, you know, what is being shown. We're trying, and I don't know if it's going to happen, um, but we're trying to build a geezer team, park skiing, geezer team. Um, we got gear, geezer team, flow or die, in our country division. We got, we're, we're all set. But anyways, but we want to go from like expert pros all because if you if you so I for anybody who's curious if you can go to the website in our country.com the peak performance aging experiment we ran where we took these ideas um we took 17 older adults ages 29 to 68 and four days on the mountain using the same ideas taught them how to park skiers scoreboard don't take my word for it go watch the freaking video we had a national geographic camera and follow us around record everything you read the white paper so um a, this stuff sort of like really does sort of work for everyone. Um, in fact, I will tell you a true story. When at the end of that video, there's a guy you'll see. This is, my name is Rick Wicks. I'm I'm, or, I'm 66 years old, and I and I caught some gear in the gear in the NAR Country program, and I think that's pretty good for an old guy. I'll come back to the geezer team in a second. But what's so amazing about that quote in that video? is what's not in the video is we had a team meeting the whole geezer team got together before we started the experiment where i broke down everything for everybody that we were going to be doing most of the people in the experiment were not expert skiers or snowboarders there a lot of them were intermediates this guy rick wicks gets on the call he's like i am 66 years old i've been skiing for 50 years i've never caught air in my life and i'm not starting now <laughs> like, okay buddy it's totally fine we will meet you where you are. We're just going to give you novel ways of moving your body over the mountain. We're not, you don't have to. So like at the end where he's like, I caught some air in the dark country program. We're like, you sure fucking did. <laughs> you know? like, but um, in the, what we're, what I want to do is I want everybody from like top pros all the way down to like the advanced beginners where, cause our whole methodology was, it was, a, it was a follow the leader based protocol that involved a lot of body cognition, mirror neurons. We did very little talking on the hill. Um, a lot of it had to do with flow and things like that. But the goal was person in front of you throws a trick, like if I throw a 360, Ryan, I'm chasing, I'm chasing Ryan, my ski partner. He throws a 360 off the jump. Maybe I don't want to catch that much air. So I'll throw a nose butter 360, which is a little mellower. The guy behind me doesn't want to do any of that. They just throw a sliding spin 360 across the surface. Right. So like, I want to build a team where you can see from the expert level all the way down to the, like literally the advanced beginner or the intermediate, like, this is where you start. This is what it looks like at every step of the way. And the biggest point is 
And this is why deliberate play matters so much. You can't suck if you're trying to be great. You can only suck if you've set down shame and set down embarrassment and just having fun playing. Because if you're trying really hard all the time and it sucks, that's a really unpleasant experience that you're not you're not learning and blocking learning. So like this kind of like follow the leader play style of doing it, especially like. I don't know how other people are. I don't mind being bad at shit. I hate being bad in public. Like, I do not want to be bad in public. Dude, right? That's like my I, last thing I want to do. I don't want to be ever, bad in public. Ever, ever. And I, and, I, and I think it's really like public shame is not in my best interest. <laughs> um, and like, I'm so crazy. I'll hang out to that stuff for years. Like, it'll ha- it'll wake me up in the middle of the night for years. Like, for sure. So like, I really have to like guard against it. And like the deliberate play, like, and that was part of the fun is when you've got like, 15 other people in a line and everybody's at a different level and nobody cares. It really helped. It really, really helped. But that's the whole point of the geezer team is to give people a different vision of what the progression ladder looks like. Cause we're only shown the end product. We're only shown, you know, the Kobe Bryant's or the LeBron James, you know what I mean? Like we see excellence all the time and we just don't see what excellence looks like along the way. You know what I mean? I yeah. Mean, I'm, I'm, I was just I'm reading, an article. you made me think of Kobe, but I was just reading an article about Kobe where it was Elijah Wan talking about when Kobe went to visit Elijah Wan to learn how to play like a center, like a classic center from the 80s, not even like a center today. He went to Elijah Wan and said, baby, I mean, this is Kobe. He's like six, four, six, six, right? Um, I was like, oh, that must have been hysterical. You must have sucked for so long until you got it and nobody sees it, right? We just see what it looks like at the end result. We think that's what it look, should look like for everybody. And it, it didn't even look like it that for those people. We're just only getting that, getting to see that. Um, so I think some of it is just like, we have to just sort of change our some of the images that we're consuming a little bit. Yeah. Anyways, that's the, the, I, I would like to build it, a geezer team. No, I love the idea of a geezer team. That sounds awesome. That's rad. I, I, I look, look. We may not be jump hucking sixty foot cliffs, but if you saw a, 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 like 30, 60 year olds doing nose butter three sixties in a line like the ice follies, you would laugh. No, I think that's so impressive. It's so inspiring. I think that's part of why I think this is so such great knowledge to apply to everyone. I think we need to be taught this. Every single person needs to learn this because there's so much ageism in the world. There's so much limitation that's either self-imposed or imposed by others that we think that as we age, we should stop doing something that's higher risk because we have more responsibilities or there's more to lose or this is going to affect my livelihood. I know that for me, what I think about now, I mean, since I, I well, broke other, my- can, Hold on one sec. I got to pause you because I just want to say, I don't have children. I don't really give a shit about this particular one, but like for anybody who has children, if you're not, continuing to push and catch like what are you actually teaching your freaking children like they're learning by example yeah. and you're shutting it down like i just think about that and i'm like whoa this is really like it's a lot more dangerous you know what i mean like you, you st- once you start looking at the facts and you're like whoa like you're you're condemning people to like a really miserable second half of their life because you, you start looking at the emotional stuff that go goes with it like you have your you're bringing on emotional problems. You're onboarding a whole bunch of stuff you don't need to be doing, and it's going to age you faster. It's going to kill you sooner, um, and you're just passing it on to your children. Yeah, this book inspired me to get on my board again. It inspired me to go outside on the street to go run because I got used to just working out at home because of COVID on my treadmill and my little safe area. I'm like, no, I need to go outside. I need to go be outdoors. I need to, you know, push myself. I need to go a little further. I need to be able to just improve and not just be in this stagnant state of complacency because I think it's really important. I can feel myself in that complacency of safety, especially, especially with my physical being, because if I get injured, I can't, 
go work. You know, I have to show up. I have to get on a flight. I have to go speak somewhere. I have to teach a class. You know, I can't very well teach a class with, you know, a cast on my leg. I mean, I could, I've done it before, (laughs) but it's just, you know, I think that fear is, is part of what keeps us. And I think reading this book really inspired me to remove those mental obstacles and remember how important it is to continue to grow. And it was actually really, it made me excited about getting older, to be honest. That's so great. That was, I mean, that was sort of my, that was sort of, that was my experience too in the book. Like that, I got, by the time I was done, I was like, oh my God, I really am actually excited about the second half of my life. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I needed the kick in the ass. Chick sent me high, gave me a kick in the ass. You know what I mean? I don't know without COVID, without the stuff that was going on in my personal life, without all that, I don't know if I would have ever gotten started. Um, but now that like, sort of like, Hopefully, you know, hopefully the book has that impact on people. Yeah. Um, I rarely say that about people. I rarely like want a book to have an impact. But this one, I'm like, no, no. If I can actually change the way people think about the second half of their lives, that would be good. I'm yeah. for it. It really was extremely comforting in, in the best way. And also in the scientific way, of course. Uh, so last thing I'll data. say, I'll close with this. Oh, we can close with this because you just said it and this was so weird. So I haven't been out in the world much still because events are just starting and I really, the book's really new. So I've talked, you know, when we ran the, we've ran those first experiments and then we took the, it turned into this class. We ran it for hundreds of people. It was all on Zoom. I haven't been in a room with people where I've talked about this. So I was just in a room over the weekend where it was the first time there were like a hundred people in the room and I talked and a bunch of people were with me and they all noticed it too. We were all talking about it afterwards. I don't know. I'm going to have to use language that is not appropriate to what happened. Cause I don't know what the right language is, but what you just said is like, when people actually figured out what the truth about the second half of their life was, there was a temperature change in the room. It was like everybody collectively let go of this like stress response that they'd probably been holding on to for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Like it was wild. I've never, like I've been speaking in front of people for forever, 30 years, 40 years, 50. Like I've never actually seen this in a room. I sort of saw it on the Zoom and I've sort of, when I'm talking to people on podcasts about the book, I can sort of sense it, but seeing it in one room, I was like, oh, well, this is actually palpable all of us sort of like live with this secret terror, right? And it and, and when somebody's like, no, 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 that's actually in your head. It doesn't match the science, doesn't match the facts, doesn't match what's really possible. All everybody's like, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm lighter. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, it's true. I mean, I definitely felt it and I'm so excited and I can't wait for everybody else to get to have that experience as well. So uh, thank you for saying that. And thank you for closing with that. Where can people go for more information? Yeah, you can, uh, www.narcountry.com is the website. NAR is G-N-A-R, it's short for gnarly. Um, There's a reason why I chose that title. I'll save it for the book. Um, Or anywhere books are sold. Amazon has it, all the bookstores have it. Great. And we'll put the links to all of those places in the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, it is in the description below. If you're listening to this, wherever you get your podcast, it's in that info button. I'm going to ask you this question. I ask it all the time. I'm curious. Your answer has always been different. I'm not going to quiz you on reminding you what your answers have been, but how do you feel radically loved? So I have to say, this is different from any other answer I've given some stuff has gone on in the past month, literally 2023, where um, partial natural disaster, COVID, I got COVID again, my wife got COVID, like a bunch of, I needed help for the first time in a really long time in a bunch of different ways. And I rarely ask for help, don't like to ask for help, whatever. And the amount like what flowed into my life was so freaking like overwhelming and from every angle um in wild wild ways i was just sort of like oh okay so like when i tell myself i'm lonely or you know there's nobody here like all that stuff you're lying buddy it's like what just happened was it was it was a display of radical love and it sort of came from everywhere and it was it was wild so like 2023 has a little bit been like that 
that that is something I've heard uh, for the third time today. Oh wow! Today, that's great. That's me. That's so, cool. and once we get off, I'll just share something really quickly with you. But um, we're gonna save that for our private conversation, which is not gonna be part of this podcast. <laughs> but thank you again. You are oh, wait, do obviously... I have to get my bong? Should I get my bong for the private conversation? <laughs> okay. You should have got it from the beginning. Why was that not part of this conversation? No, I, no that's gonna be we're gonna, stoned with Stephen and Rosie. It's gonna be a separate <laughs> oh my podcast. God, we should series. do a podcast. We're gonna do our we'll do a series. Stoned oh with Stephen and Rosie. That would be so Rosie. awesome. You're All the right. best. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. You're amazing. Thanks, Rosie. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Loved Podcast. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook at Radically Loved Rosie, on Instagram at Rosie Acosta, and Twitter at Rosie Acosta. By the way, this is original music by DJ Taz Rashid. You can follow DJ Taz on Spotify and check out the best music for yoga and meditation. This has been a Mod Pod Studio production. Check them out at www.modpodstudio.com.